So, so the title is New Approaches to the Cloud Rain Aerosol Climate System Challenges, which, uh, you know, when uh, you did ask me for a title, I, I didn't know what I'm going to talk about. So I said, okay, I will give uh, the general title, the most general title that will allow, we, allow me to improvise before the talk. So I don't think that it gets much more general than this title. Before uh, talking to, to the point, I want to highlight uh, members of my group that really you will see that many of the things that I'm referring to or showing or the ideas came uh, uh, with the, during interactions with them or from their work, you will see few reference so uh, by all means, the stuff that I'm showing is not my work, it's uh, mostly their work. And also I want to highlight two colleagues that uh, uh, you will see, I'm going to show you kind of a project that start as a hobby. It was so um, dangerous. I mean, I, I didn't want any of my uh, students to, to deal with it because it was too new and too risky. So uh, I played with friends and uh, mostly with Graham and with Ellie. And uh, um, many of the results, I mean, uh, that you will see today are the outcome of this interaction. And now, uh, 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 again, as you are not supposed to do, I will uh, list the topics that I will not discuss today. So, um, you know, the title is a bit, a bit misleading. So I want to emphasize that I'm, I'm not going to, to talk about microphysics. Uh, microphysics, as uh, many of you may know, is a really great portion of my research and uh, dynamics and microphysics and uh, cloud resolving models and observations, but not today. So I'm not going to talk about the, the very nice new approaches to cloud resolving models. And uh, uh, as you may know, uh, uh, currently, uh, I mean, today, this week and next week is the AGU and you can see many, many talks about uh, uh, super pixel, super uh, uh, Lagrangian approach, uh, super parcel approaches. I'm not going to discuss these exciting uh, uh, ideas at all. This is not the topic of this talk. I'm uh, not going to discuss new methods of observations or of how using measurements. So my work will be almost purely theoretical today. Again, not as uh, many of my, most of my research and Again, to clarify, because of the title, it's not machine learning, uh, AI approaches to cloud and climate, not today. Again, very exciting, but not today. So once I clarify what I'm not going to talk about, I'm going to, uh, I, I will move to the business and I will do, I will start it with a quite traditional statement. So whoever is dealing with clouds and climate, and whoever needs to write a proposal, he writes, he most likely writes these lines, okay? That clouds play a critical role in the Earth's climate system. Clouds are responsible between half to two thirds of the, of the planetary albedo. So it's a big responsibility that uh, clouds has on their shoulders, okay? An error of a small error in uh, our cloud uh, measurements, cloud understanding could be translate to large portion of the anthropogenic effect uh, in units of energy or of flux, unit, energy per time per uh, uh, unit area. So we need to understand theoretically clouds in a precision, in a very high precision. Okay, and at the end, we always write that the inaccurate description of the cloud properties yields the largest errors in the climate prediction. In other words, clouds are responsible to great part, if not most of our uncertainty 
in climate prediction. And I want to, to, to ask why. I mean, why clouds are responsible to, I mean, why clouds uh, share such a large responsibility of our uh, uncertainty? Okay, I mean, there are many complicated processes, nonlinear processes in the Earth system. It's not only clouds. We understand that dynamics has a lot of complexities and we understand that the interaction between biology and the atmosphere is crazy. And uh, again, uh, uh, fluctuation in the ocean and ocean dynamics and, and biology in the ocean and you name it. And nevertheless, we say that clouds are responsible for most of the errors or most of the uncertainty. And the question is why? So first of all, I want to say that uh, this statement is, is quite true to the best of my understanding, okay? I am standing behind this statement and I would like to focus uh, the talk today on this, exactly on this question, why? Okay, and uh, in order to, to answer it, I want to take you to, um, to a question of errors, but we will not deal with errors. We, we will not deal with measurements problems, but uh, this is the way to start. So if you have an inaccurate description of clouds, or of aerosols or of rain, you can roughly classify the, the, the problem to, to more linear challenges and to more nonlinear challenges. And nothing is linear, not, nothing is truly linear in, in our Earth system. Linearity is always kind of a nice approximation, but it works well for great regime of the physics. And, um, and, and, you know, linear challenges could be error in the measurements. It could be even great chapters in radiation transfer. So if we have uh, uh, errors in the optical properties of clouds or the optical properties of aerosols, yes, it will yield an error, but the error will be proportional to the uncertainty. Okay? On the other hand, if we are dealing with nonlinear challenges, it's very hard to estimate the error or the effect based on the perturbation. This is by definition a nonlinear system, right? That the link between perturbation and the outcomes is not easy to scale. Of course, uh, once you have a subset that is nonlinear, even the linear challenges, if they are coupled to the nonlinear challenges, it all becomes nonlinear. And this is the case uh, with clouds. And today we will focus the talk on nonlinear dynamics, nonlinear challenges. So we all like to say that clouds are, cloud physics has a, a great of nonlinear portion, but I want really, okay, to look on to look on the elephant in the room, to look on the eyes of the elephant in the room. Nonlinear challenges. And to dive in, because I'm sure that not everyone here is a, a, an expert in dealing with nonlinear dynamics. So I try to find a, an easy a introduction to nonlinear dynamics. And this is what I found in Wikipedia. And it is very nice, but it's everything but simple. But anyway, you can see a brave guy that try to take the field of complex systems and to classify complex systems. And you can see how wide uh, nonlinear dynamics or complex systems are. So we can see the field of nonlinear dynamics and you have the differential equations and the partial and the ordinary and the delayed equa equations in here. And you have the systems theory with the emergence and with, the, with, the, with feedbacks and how to do with feedbacks. And of course, pattern formation. Pattern formation is one of my great uh, uh, hobbies and uh, challenges. And I will show you how we are dealing with it. And then we, can, we, we go to evolution and adaptation, but evolution and adaptation also refer to mathematical 
non-biological systems and networking. So you know, uh, I will show later how network is all related, uh, can be related to clouds. And basically this classification is a good start, but actually it doesn't work because everything is everything. And you can take ideas from networks and put them on nonlinear dynamics, and you can take nonlinear dynamics and put them in system theory. And it's a brave uh, 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 attempt to classify this field, but uh, actually, you know, it's it's very questionable. Two two properties he decided to put out of the chart in the center. And actually I like the idea. So the concept of emergence. Now, what is the concept of emergence? Uh, suppose that we have a crazy system with hundreds of processes competing and many of the processes are non-linear and there are competition and feedbacks. And it's very hard, even with our best models, to resolve all the scales, all the problems that we need in order to solve the problem. We can take a larger zoom out and we can look for emergence. So what is emergence? Emergence is the outcome of all the competing feedbacks. So I can ask, can I find an island of sanity out of all these crazy processes that compete and try to take over. And if I do, I can use it. I can write equations that describe the emergent behavior. Okay? And below you see self-organization. And this is very nice that he puts self-organization because it's common. This is common to all the fields that we see. And it is as important as emergence, okay? And I'm going to devote part of my talk today to self-organization. Good. So when, uh, you know, usually in traditional atmospheric physics and uh, cloud physics, we are dealing, or we are not dealing directly with nonlinear dynamics. We see nonlinear dynamics, we have problems with turbulence, we have problems with mixing, we have problems with entrainment, but we try to resolve it as much as we can. We are not calling it all the time nonlinear dynamics. And by doing so, we are kind of strangers to the a very uh, exciting field of nonlinear dynamics. And I'm trying to combine the two fields, okay? So when people are talking about uh, nonlinear processes in, uh, in, in the atmosphere, what are the keywords that emerge or that come? So feedbacks, of course, we are dealing with feedbacks. We are worried about feedbacks. We want to know what would be the feedbacks of the climate system to global warming? This is number one question, okay? Coupling, we know that processes are coupled and that's what makes them very challenging and complicated. We have competition between processes. We have scale mixing. Scale mixing is an important concept. We cannot do easy scale separation. If we could, the, the, the answer would be much easier, but we cannot because we have penetration, we have percolation between scales. Stuff that start in one scale, propagate to the next scales and so on and so forth. That's why, by the way, simple turbulence theory does not work well in cloud physics because we have scale mixing and we have sources in many, many scales. So Kolmogorov approaches are very challenging when we are dealing with uh, such a system. Bifurcation, bifurcation would be the hero of my talk. So I will explain more what are bifurcations and fixed points and attractors and stability and non-stability, oscillations versus steady state, chaotic behavior, turbulence, dissipation, organization and pattern formation. These are all keywords that comes when we study 
cloud physics and uh, in general atmospheric physics or climate. And I want to, to, to really to give them the respect uh, in this talk. And now I want to translate and uh, this is going to be a long slide and you are welcome to stop me because I'm going to finish microphysics everything on this, uh, on this slide. So it's, a, it's, it's like one, two minutes microphysics. So when we are talking about nonlinear processes, how does it reflect in cloud physics? So excuse, excuse me, uh, all of these who are new to cloud physics, I will use terminology that is uh, more on the expert level, but it would be only this slide. If we are talking about uh, microphysics, we can, we can start with the uh, sub-micron scales with nucleation of aerosols, right? We have primary and secondary aerosols, and we know that secondary aerosol nucleate, and we want to understand their nucleation, and it's not linear process, okay? We understand, we, we need to understand nucleation, and then I differ nucleation from activation of droplets, although it's very close. But when I say activation, I'm talking about activation of droplets as opposed to haze. And then we have the color theory and whoever learned color theory, we know that it's completely nonlinear. We have comp uh, competition, we have feedbacks, we have bifurcation in, in, the, in the beautiful color theory. And then we have droplet mobility. Okay, once we created a, 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 a cloud with droplets, it's very much important if the droplets are many and small or few and large because they will move differently in the cloud. On the next time step, they will be in different place within the cloud. So droplet mobility is, you know, if you want to understand invigoration, you need to understand droplet mobility. It's as simple as is, but it's non-linear. It is linked to the activation. Okay, and then of course, we all know that collision coalescence of droplets and collection efficiency and rain formation is completely nonlinear. We call it stochastic processes. Okay, and we know that we can look on two clouds and the clouds would be the same. They will look the same, they will have the same sizes and one of them suddenly will start to, to rain and the other will not. And we want to understand this avalanche effect. Why? Why do we have such uh, instabilities in the cloud? And then when we move up, we are moving to the crazy world of freezing and the three phase problem and mixed phases and mobility of crystals and which, uh, what, what is the shape of the ice crystals and so on. This is the, I finished my lecture on uh, microphysics and I'm moving to dynamics on the cloud scale. So once you understand microphysics, you understand it, it's tightly coupled to the dynamics. Actually, it's one field. You must understand dynamics in order to understand microphysics and vice versa. So we have coupling between uh, microphysics and dynamics or thermodynamics, and we know that the supersaturation depends on the microphysics, of course. And the microphysics depends heavily on the supersaturation and on the buoyancy and on the updraft and on the latent heat release. So everything is coupled, okay? When we solve the differential equations, they are all coupled dynamics microphysics, right? And then we have to partition the cloud to core and periphery. The core is more adiabatic and therefore the physics is 100 times easier. However, on the periphery, we have mixing between the dry air. And how do we know if we have evaporation or condensation? Well, we don't, it depends, right? And sometimes you see a cloud, but actually it's evaporated, it's subsaturated. So you enter a cloud, it looks like a cloud, the buoyancy is negative and the cloud is, is actually great part of the cloud is subsaturated. It takes time to evaporate, that's why we see a cloud, okay? And then we have coherent flow versus turbulence, okay? 
how come do we have inverse cascade in the cloud that small to uh, small effect effects on the small scales percolate to create a coherent flow on the larger scales okay it's very interesting and we have and now i'm going a bit out from the cloud and we have the subsidizing shell of a uh, downdraft around the cloud okay and then, of course, we have interaction with radiation. So again, order of magnitude more complexity because everything interacts with the long wave and with the short wave, and we must understand it. And then we move to the field scale, and we know that clouds change the thermodynamics that created them. So we must understand not only how the thermodynamics affect clouds, but how, affect, how clouds affect thermodynamics. And then we have rain evaporation below clouds base that create cold pools and uh, create uh, uh, drives self-organization. And we have gra gravity waves, external and internal, and they all interact. So welcome to the, wo the nonlinear world of clouds, cloud physics, and uh, uh, it's, it's a huge domain that uh, you need a whole course or maybe 10 courses to cover. And actually many of uh, the questions that I ask here are open, okay? They are not known. We try to understand them better, but they are not known. And today I will focus on small subsets. So I will focus on the larger scales and I will focus on these keywords. So I'm talking about bifurcations, oscillations, steady state and chaos solutions, and I'm going to give a lot of respect to organization and pattern formation. So you see, this is a, a bit, not a bit, it's completely out of the standard uh, regime of cloud physics. Uh, and I hope uh, that you will find it uh, important and interesting. So bifurcations, whoever is not familiar with the term, Many of the functions that we are dealing with are nonlinear, and many of them have bifurcation. Bif bifurcation means that for a certain regime, they could be well behaved, and then suddenly, in a very sudden jump, they move to a different behavior. And whoever is familiar with the uh, logistic equation, which is the most simple example for bifurcation, it's a beautiful example of how the most, one of the most simple possible equations becomes crazy when we are exploring it in the parameter regime. And uh, the stuff that you see in panel A, is, is, it looks like the uh, uh, bifurcation period doubling of a logistic equation, but actually it's a cloud equation that I will introduce later. And uh, basically you see for a certain regime that the clouds are well behaved and suddenly they jump. Now, why bifurcation gets such a respect in this talk? Because uh, it, it, such a sudden changes can imply sudden changes in the climate properties of clouds. So we must be able to anticipate bifurcation. We must know how to calculate them and we must know how to predict bifurcations. And I want to show you the simplest, most idea of bifurcation. It's not the best, but I'm, I'm relying on, on, on the assumptions that uh, you are familiar with the water vapor feedback. So suppose, just suppose that we are facing a global warming. So global warming will be uh, translated to increase in the SST, in the sea surface temperature. Actually, one of the most straightforward uh, forward, uh, 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 measures for uh, global warming is changes, are changes in SST. So we will have warmer mixed layer, warmer uh, 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 ocean, and the ocean hit the atmosphere above it, right? So it's actually the long wave from the ocean that hits 
uh, most of the atmosphere, and therefore we will have hot, hotter atmosphere. So warmer uh, uh, ocean and hotter atmosphere above it means uh, more capacity of water vapors and more evaporation. So we will have increasing evaporation. But as we know, water vapors are almost the best molecule for greenhouse effect, right? So immediately we have a positive feedback, right? Because the ocean is get warmer, uh, the ocean evaporates more water vapors to the atmosphere that is getting warmer. So the capacity of holding water vapor is larger. We have more water vapor in the atmosphere. Therefore, we have more greenhouse effect. And therefore, we have more warming of the ocean. And uh, it's, a, it's a very disturbing positive feedback, right? And this positive feedback really fear us. I mean, we are frightening, we, are, we fear this feedback. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, uh, central question that we ask. What is the water vapor feedback and how it will behave? But on the moment that we form a cloud, we reverse the effect. So at once, we move from warming to cooling. To cooling. Why? Because clouds, by the phase change and by the droplet distribution, they uh, reflect a uh, short wave as opposed to water vapor and, uh, and the rest of the atmosphere or most of the, of the atmosphere, right? So uh, suddenly we have a reflector that reflect part of the solar energy back to space. And we move at once from a positive feedback to a possible negative feedback. And it, it is at once because as you may know, uh, uh, clouds occupy, they use small portion of the water vapor in the atmosphere. So it's only tiny portion of the water vapor that have to become a cloud, has to reach a super saturation and boom, we have a, 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 a transition from positive to possibly negative. Why do I say possibly? Because it depends if the system uh, created cloud uh, near the ocean or if it created high clouds, because as you may know, uh, low cloud tend to cool because their short wave effect is much more uh, efficient the, than the uh, long wave effect. They are too warm, as opposed to cirrus clouds or to anvils that are relatively optically thin in the visible, but they are very efficient greenhouse components. So this is the scenario that we want for negative feedback. And this is the scenario that we fear that we will have more high clouds and less shallow clouds. But this was a very uh, brief and not the most uh, 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 sophisticated example for possible bifurcation. And uh, we will see many more actually later on in the talk. So we finished bifurcation. And now I want to talk about self-organization. So what is self-organization? Self-organization in a dynamical system means that uh, uh, first of all, you have interactions between the components, okay? If the components will not interact, uh, will not be coupled, you cannot have self-organization. They need to transfer information. They need to affect each other. Now, self-organization could be due to very weak coupling. The coupling should not be very strong. Actually, there are many studies that shows that there is no weak coupling, okay? Weak coupling may take more to organize, but once you get organization, it actually can be very rich. So for example, we all know the V-shape of large birds uh, migrating, and this is a very simple uh, uh, self-organization of these birds. And the rule is simple, okay? Each bird had to follow the birds either on the left or on the right. This is it. 
And by doing so, you get a V-shape, okay? And uh, it's very easy to create, so the interaction, the coupling is very simple and you see a beautiful V-shape or swear or swarm uh, uh, shapes of birds migrating. And I want to say that you have self-organization all over nature. So of course the, the, the upper left panel is clouds that we are going to talk, but uh, the lower left is a canopy in, in, in the forest and you can see how competition on the sunlight uh, self-organize the canopy in a hexagonal or almost hexagonal shape. And if we are talking about hexagonal, you can go and uh, see the, 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 the giraffe shape that uh, is uh, actually was proven to be statistically hexagonal. And we have the fairy uh, cycles in the desert that are kind of, uh, today we understand that they are self-organized and I will be able, I will be happy to talk more about them, but uh, only if you will ask. So self-organization. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, usually when we talk about self-organization of clouds, we talk about marine stratocumulus over the ocean. It's beautiful, it's easy to see. But actually I want to talk today a little bit about my most beloved clouds and most beloved clouds are over the Amazon, but not the monsters. I'm talking about the shallow warm clouds that cover a great portion of the Amazon, especially in the early afternoon. Later on in, in the day, the convection takes over and it shifts to be uh, deeper clouds, but you can see these clouds uh, do you see uh, the movement of my, of my mouse? Can you follow it? You did? You, can yes. You, yeah? Okay, good. So these clouds are relatively small and they are extremely sensitive. So first of all, they cover a great part of the Amazon almost throughout the year, not only on the dry season, you can see them on the transition season and you can see them on the wet season. Of course, on the dry season, they capture much more area. And uh, as you may know, smoke uh, from uh, biomass burning can kill them and they are very sensitive. They are so sensitive and so um, spoiled that they are not willing to form over the Amazon. So actually you can see the Amazon by the absence of these clouds, okay? And let me zoom in. So this is Belém and here you see the, the no cloud Amazon and you see other uh, uh, streams uh, of the Amazon and it's beautiful. But if you will take a, a zoom in, if you look on these clouds closer, you see that they are very well organized. So we have high level of organization. It's not a random organization cloud. So first of all, their size distribution is relatively narrow. You see that the size range is uh, between few kilometers, between fraction of a kilometer to few kilometers. Actually, I could show you histograms uh, later on, but uh, not now. And if you can follow my, my cursor, you can see linear shape. So they tend to have linear shapes. And sometimes you see the linear shapes and sometimes you don't see the linear shape, but it's between a, a, a grid to a linear shape. It's not random. And these clouds are really well organized. And what does it mean? It means that they have a way to affect each other. They are coupled. Otherwise, we will not have such organization, okay? And uh, we are studying them. And uh, now uh, we published this year a paper showing that these clouds are actually very common 
uh, under many different uh, meteorological conditions. So you can find them in the tropics, of course, in the Amazon and in Africa and in, the, in, in Indonesia and you name it, over the tropics, but you can find them also in, central, in the central plains of the US and you can find them in Asia and you can find them in Europe in completely different environments. And you see how similar, you, you can see that basically from the snapshots, you, you cannot see great differences in the patterns, okay? The patterns and the size distribution are really similar. So clouds, many types of clouds, if not all of the clouds are self-organized. And uh, what is the difference between self-organized to organized to just organized? I will happy to answer or to discuss later. We are using to think about uh, marine stratocumulus, we are, which are shallow clouds to be organized. But actually uh, here we show deep post-frontal clouds and these clouds are rainy and they are very large. I mean, we are talking about clouds of six, seven, eight kilometer thickness, okay? So it's not shallow boundary layer clouds. And I hope that you can see the cellular organization of the clouds. And these clouds form on, uh, on, on the seashore of Israel. Okay, so this is the east uh, part of the Mediterranean. And uh, you can see transition from cloud streets to open cells. But these open cells are six kilometer clouds. It's not shallow marine stratocumulus. Nevertheless, we see a lot of similarities, okay? And uh, below you can see the distribution of vertical velocities and rain, and you can see how, how rain can uh, get kind of a train linear shape. And uh, we are working on these clouds and we see it's, it, this, this cloud, this cellular shape are very common and they are deep. And uh, to show you uh, how they form. I hope that you can see the movie. So this is a movie of one of the cases uh, of uh, uh, the East Mediterranean and the color refer to divergence and convergence. So, Ilan, yes. <coughs> sorry, it's, uh, it's a static uh, figure. Yes, I didn't, start, I didn't start running it. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, let, let's hope that it will work. The colors refer to uh, convergence and divergence, okay? So we have divergence if it's blue and convergence if it's uh, red. And the contours are uh, contours of rain on the surface, okay? And this is a real case that we try to model. And do you see the movie? Okay, and I hope that you can see the transition from cloud streets to cellular convection. You can see how slowly but surely the system is organized in cellular shape. And uh, I hope that you are convinced. And this is a deep system. It's not boundary layer clouds of marine uh, stratocumulus. We are talking about post-frontal, relatively deep system. So what's going on? Okay, we see kind of a general a universal way of organization of clouds. And uh, I hope to convince you that it's very important to understand it. And now I'm moving to our beloved marine stratocumulus clouds. And these clouds forming, covering great portion of the globe. And they are regarded as the reflector of the climate system. Why? Because the, on one hand, they are very shallow, so they are warm, so they don't have a significant greenhouse effect. On the other hand, they are very good reflectors, so they reflect a great portion of the shortwave radiation, the solar radiation, and it's really important to understand them. And these clouds uh, come, comes these clouds come in two flavors, okay? We have the vanilla and we have the chocolate. So the vanilla, we call them the closed cells, and they have very 
a, a large cloud coverage and their albedo is high. And the other uh, state, we call it open state. And the open state is completely different. And uh, basically we see great part of the ocean and therefore the albedo is relatively low and they reflect much less of the shortwave energy back to space. So it is extremely important for us to understand the transition between open to close. If we want to understand, if we want to calculate uh, energy budgets and we must understand how these transitions depend on aerosol and on the environmental conditions. So warmer ocean, what will be the, the, the translation of warmer ocean on such transitions? Okay, so I hope that you uh, appreciate the importance. And in this picture, actually we see it's a summary of all of my talk because we see, uh, of course, self-organization. You see that the clouds are well organized and they have a, a beautiful patterns and beautiful shapes, but we see a very clear bifurcation, right? Because we have a sharp transition from open to close and sometimes for the same environmental condition, okay? The same, completely the same thermodynamics, completely the same aerosol loading. So what is going on? Why do we have such a bifurcation? And not only bifurcation, we have a memory effect and we have hysteresis, you name it. It's so complex and so beautiful. So we see pattern formation, we see steady state, we see oscillations, and maybe we see chaos chaotic solution, and uh, I will show you why. In order to show you why, I am zooming in to one example. Okay, one example, how do I take all the uh, bombastic words that uh, I introduced so far and use them to learn something new? So I want to talk, uh, uh, to give you a short, brief introduction to open and closed cells. So suppose we see closed cells. So this is kind of a cross section of the closed cells. And if we uh, look on the internal dynamics of the closed cells, we see that the updraft is coming in the middle and the downdraft is well confined and coming on the edges. So most of the cloud is updraft, but very weak updraft. And only on the walls, we see downdrafts, okay? And of course, clouds need updrafts to form. And therefore, this is the, a very simplistic uh, dynamical description of closed cell. This is the dynamics of each cell in the closed cell. However, in the open cell, it's the other way around. So the updraft are uh, along the walls and the drown drafts are in the middle. So immediately you can understand that you will have clouds along the walls and you have voids in the middle. So basically it's kind of a topological problem, how to shift from close to open, you need to reverse the dynamics. And there is a beautiful answer to this, but just I want you to appreciate that close and open cells means different opposite dynamics. So this is a, a closed cells and this is open cells where the clouds form in the walls and the center in our voids. Okay, and now I want to, to, to design a toy model. And it would be so simplistic that it's almost a crime. Okay, so what are my basic assumptions? And please don't regard me as a criminal. My basic assumptions are, first of all, that clouds evolve, so I have uh, enough instability to create a cloud. And the way that I describe the cloud is very simplistic. It's exponential function, which means that I have a kind of a saturation, uh, H naught is the saturation, is the maximal thickness that the cloud would have. 
and it takes time for the, the cloud to, to, to build up and it's kind of an exponential uh, system. So I have the cloud shape depends on the time by which it takes to, 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 to build up and the, the, the scalar that uh, describes the maximum thickness of the cloud once it falls. Okay, so this is one criminalistic assumption about cloud formation. The second assumption, and I hope that you will agree with me, is that rain consume clouds. Okay, I hope that uh, nobody is uh, ha have uh, a problem with this assumption. But, and here, this is the this is the place where I cheat. So this line is very short. And this is the essence of my cheating for the last five years. There is a delay between the cloud evolution and the onset of rain and the consumption of the cloud. So it takes time for the stochastic processes to kick in and to cons consume the cloud, okay? What is the delay? Well, the delay depends on aerosols and depends on the thermodynamics and you name it, but there is a delay. Okay, so the fourth assumption is aerosol affect all of the above. Okay, we know it. I mean, we, we learn uh, microphysics and dynamics and uh, invigoration and uh, rain suppression and you name it. And we know that aerosol will affect all the, of the above. And we try to take these basic assumptions and to write equations that are based on cloud physics. So I'm not going to spend your time on the equations. My point is that all the, the, the ideas are coming from uh, uh, ideas from cloud physics. So nothing is imposed uh, in, in a, in a, in a, uh, from the outside. Okay, everything is coming from cloud physics. So liquid water pass is proportional to liquid to the mixing ratio or to liquid water content. And uh, in adiabatic cloud, liquid water content is growed linearly with height, and therefore we can integrate for the, link, the uh, liquid water pass. And you know that marine stratocumulus are, I mean, the, the adiabatic assumption is not bad, but if the, if the clouds are not adiabatic, the exponent here would not be two, it would be a bit different, but Basically, grosso modo, this is uh, what we are doing, and we are saying that uh, we have a kind of exponential term that uh, let the clouds grow or recharge, and we have the discharge due to the rain, and the rain is proportional to the liquid water pass, and the rain consume liquid water pass. So let me move on to the two equations that uh, uh, form our toy model. So basically, a very, I mean, it's a crime how simple the model is, but I will talk about it a lot. Uh, it's a toy model. And for me, toy model is a compliment. It's not, uh, it's not negative, it's a positive, because from toy model, there is a, 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 a great chance that you will be able to learn something new. And later on, you, you will have to hook to reality to see if it makes sense. Anyway, so we have a differential equation uh, for the cloud thickness, and we have differential equation for the concentration, for the aerosol, but it's not aerosol, it's CCM. It's the portion of the aerosol that uh, participate as cloud condensation nuclei. And basically, it looks very, very innocent, right? I mean, the, 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 it's, it looks like OD, very uh, uh, innocent OD, but there is a cheating here and the cheating is the delay. Okay, we have on the, on the, on the sync term, the nonlinear sync term, we have a delay. And once you introduce a delay to a differential equation, it's, uh, it, it is called DDE, delay differential equation, it is, uh, you, you increase the complexity by many orders of magnitudes. And basically many of the equations you cannot solve. Okay, you can explore, but you cannot solve. So we have these two cute equations that look innocent. And basically 
I want to show you the results. Okay, I'm jumping to the results. So we run this toy model and uh, uh, we hold, we held all the parameters of the equations constant and we played only with n, only with, uh, with, the, uh, with the parameters that control the initial uh, aerosol concentration, okay? So we want to see sensitivity to aerosols. And what do we get, okay? If we have very low concentration of aerosols, the system collapse, okay? You cannot hold a cloud if you have no aerosols, okay? Clouds, as we all know, needs, they need aerosol. And uh, if you have too few of aerosols, they will grow faster and they will fall, they will sediment. And basically it's unstable system, okay? You cannot hold a cloud in a very pristine, extremely pristine environment. And then when you increase the uh, aerosol concentration, but still very pristine, you get oscillations. So uh, when you solve the equations, you get oscillations. And I will explain later what are these oscillations, but basically you, you get oscillation, but not only you get oscillations, the system want to push uh, uh, the, 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 the solution regime to the collapse mode. Why? Because once you get oscillations, you get clouds, there is a very strong, relatively strong rain, and then you have washout, and then uh, from few tens of uh, 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 CCNs per CC, you move to much less, and then the system again collapses. Okay? So the system want to be locked on this mode. This is my point. Okay, so forcing, okay, let me go on. When you increase the aerosol levels, suddenly you suppress rain. And when you suppress rain, you close the cells. Okay, and once you close the cells, okay, you get kind of a steady state. What is a steady state? Steady state means that there is, that you, you have drizzle, Okay, but you have a perfect balance between a uh, recharge and discharge. Okay, recharge due to the thermodynamics of the cloud. Okay, you always renew your cloud exactly on the same rate that the drizzle consumed the cloud. So this is a steady state. Okay, and when you increase the, the, the aerosol concentration even more, Basically, it's a closed cells, and uh, and uh, and uh, it's a, a, you 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 get kind of a saturation to the level where uh, to the thickness of the cloud. They want to to reach uh, H naught. So basically, again, once we are locked on this regime, the system want to stay in this regime, and basically we have a, what do we have? We have a classical bifurcation, okay? A classical bifurcation means that there is kind of a barrier between the two states, okay? And that once you are in one of the states, the system wants to stay there, okay? And you need kind of something, a forcing to push the system from one state to the other state, okay? So we have a bifurcation and we have uh, these two possible solutions. Okay, now, as I introduced uh, before, these uh, two equations uh, look so innocent, right? I mean, the ODEs with the nonlinear term, but the delay makes them a monster. Okay, so basically it's a, a monster uh, to solve a problem. And uh, we try even to simplify it and we take a kind of non-dimensional form. And this is the form that we are dealing with. So it's, we reduce the system only to one equation. It, it's unit, unitless and we did it non-dimensional and look how innocent it is, right? You, you want to hug it. I mean, how, it doesn't get much simpler, right? But it's a monster, okay? 
And uh, we are doing a lot of efforts to solve these uh, nonlinear uh, delay equations. And uh, in two uh, recent papers, we are showing uh, an attempts to understand this uh, uh, equation. And uh, we learn that the system has bifurcation from steady state to oscillations, and then it, it moves to chaotic regime, and the chaotic regime is moved by period doubling. So you have more and more solutions as you move, and you have islands of sanity within this uh, chaos. And then uh, on, uh, on a recent uh, paper, we try to approximate this equation by ODs, and we show that these ODs can be approximated in a, in a, using the uh, central manifold theory. And uh, this approximation is, is, uh, is not simple, but basically it, allow us, it allows us to investigate uh, these equations in more standard tools. So far about uh, this example. So basically we took a set of equations that, uh, you know, it's almost a crime for how simple they are. And we learn that clouds could oscillate. We learn that we should regard closed cells as steady state. And we learn to estimate the bifurcation. And this is only from this toy model. Okay, so now we are developing language for cloud physics, uh, you know, using nonlinear dynamics terms. Okay, steady state. Who is speaking about steady state and clouds, right? And who is speaking about oscillations in clouds? Well, on the recent, uh, once we learn the solutions of uh, these equations, we went back to many models that we run on cloud resolving models. And we could find in many different examples that actually, yes, we see oscillations. Now the oscillations are not perfect and they are not clean and it's always noisy. And of course you have a lot of competitions and you change the thermodynamics and you name it. But nevertheless, if you take average properties of the domain, suddenly you see oscillations, okay? And this is for marine uh, uh, stratocumulus, but on a recent walk from two years ago, we took uh, a cumulus, straight cumulus in the middle of the ocean field. And here you can see a temporal evolution of uh, basically condensation versus evap evaporation of the whole field. And uh, okay, you need some imagination, but I can, I think that you can see oscillations. Good, so oscillations. Now we wanted to find the link between close and open and to prove it from data. So we took uh, geostationary data and we developed uh, ways. So let me do it a bit slower. These are two images of a satellite, of geosatellite, uh, of the Severi instrument uh, uh, over uh, the Atlantic. And uh, I have here uh, two examples of closed and open uh, cells fields. And uh, I, we developed a way to Lagrangian follow them. So basically, by using statistical properties of the field, we can follow the field throughout the day. Not using the advection, uh, it's not a model, we use the data in order to follow it. And this is an example of a correlation. And you can see that once you find the right displacement, it's very sharp. So basically the quality of these uh, uh, Lagrangian uh, uh, followers were very bad, uh, very good. And basically we have kind of uh, LES, but true data LES because we have the same data following it for many hours for the, all, for, for the whole day. And basically uh, we took uh, let's focus on the open cells and on the closed cells. 
And basically, if we follow the field for 10 hours throughout the, uh, the daylight, and basically we created an, a cross section, a Hofmuller diagram of, uh, of one of the cross section. And what do I want to show? I want to show that, okay, so this is time, this is time of the day, and this is a, a, the spatial scale, and these are closed cells, and these are open cells. So basically, when you follow closed cells, you can see that they are in a close to be in steady state. Basically, you can follow the same cell for 10 hours. However, if you move to the open cells, you see them dance like crazy. You see the oscillations. So again, we have kind of a nice feedback that our primitive toy model could predict something real, or at least give us ideas about something real. And uh, you know, uh, we were very happy about the oscillations, but actually the steady state is even more interesting. Why? Because, you know, there is a very nice uh, 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 scaling law between the uh, uh, spatial size of a feature in the atmosphere and the time life, the, the lifetime of this feature. So for example, if you take a small cumulus, the lifetime of a small cumulus or, you know, order of one kilometer would be half an hour give and take, okay? If you take a deep convective cell, a, a, a CB over the Amazon, it, it could be half a day to a day, right? And if you take a synoptic uh, uh, system, it, it's, a, it's a scale of a week. So we know that uh, there is a very nice link between the spatial scale and the temporal scale and the lifetime. And when we put the open cells, they sit really where they should be there because the lifetime of a cloud uh, in, in the open cell regimes is order of uh, hours, okay? Because, you, you know, order of an hour. However, if you move to the closed cells that we call them steady state, they live much more than they should. So if you do analysis of the convective cell, you see that most of the cells in the, open, in the closed cells are smaller than 10 kilometers. Okay, so it's order of 10 kilometers or less. Okay, so how come that a convective cell, that the, the size of it is order of five kilometers can live 10 hours? This is really a strange, question. And basically what we know is, the, uh, the answer is that due to self-organization, this closed cell, closed cells adopt the lifetime of the whole field. So basically you can uh, uh, imagine the whole field as lock uh, in the state and very rigid. And basically it does not let the cell to fade away. It means that, you know, if these cells are living for 10 hours, it doesn't mean that the same water would be there for 10 hours. No, actually there is always circulation of the water, okay? It means that the recharge and the discharge of these cells are in balance. And I hope that this is clear. And my talk is, became very long as always. So I will try to wrap up and to uh, move fast to the next, uh, to the last part. And the last part would be, okay, so we took a toy model and we described a very simplistic uh, cloud that can oscillate or can be in a steady state, but how do you move it? How do you move forward? So in order to move forward, we need to couple between the clouds to create self-organization. So what is the way by which we should couple the clouds? Okay, so if you remember when we described the open cells, we, sell, we said that uh, along the walls, there is an updraft 
and the app draft create a cloud and the cloud grows. And once the cloud grows, it starts to rain. Oh, this is a game changer. Once rain fall below cloud field, we usually get rain evaporation. And rain evaporation is a very strong component that decouples the cloud from the feeding tube. So basically the feeding tube of fluxes that's coming from the surface is decoupled by the downdraft that are created due to rain evaporation. And basically this could reverse the dynamics. On the other hand, when we look on the closed cells on steady state, basically we have a, a, a convective cell that theoretically could live forever. Okay, so how do we translate such coupling to differential equations? Well, one way to do it, and this is a, 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 an article that they did about our work in physics today, and I like their cartoon. So basically they show exactly what we did, what we said today that, okay, at the beginning we have clouds and we have updrafts and then the clouds start to rain and the rain create downdrafts and the downdraft encourage the formation of the next generation clouds and kills the cloud themselves. So the next generation cloud will form and later on will rain and create the next generation and so on. So this is a very nice way to couple it. And we tried to couple it. So we created a, a, a way of uh, uh, coupling the clouds and uh, we added a coupling factor. So the, cl the clouds are affected by the state of their neighbors. And we created kind of a Koramoto spring. So we have many springs and you can see the correlation between number of clouds. So this, these are the clouds that we had, and this is the correlation. And you see that some of the clouds are fully positively correlated and some are not correlate. And then you see complexity. Suddenly when you move to a field regime and many clouds, of, all clouds affect all clouds, it becomes very messy. Okay. And we try to study it and there are a lot of, it, it, this takes us to network, uh, ideas because we use Koramoto uh, network uh, oscillators and we try to study this cloud. I won't bother you with this. We saw a lot of complexity emerging in very simple question. And then we try to do it in a more robust way and to actually take our simple equation and to add a coupling term. So the coupling term could be due to co continuity. Basically, whatever goes up should go down or diffusion. And I don't have time to talk deeply about, uh, about this because it's a, it's a cool stuff, but it's completely new. Uh, so I will show you first attempts of playing with such uh, uh, models. And basically in this model, I put at the beginning only one cloud in the middle and then all clouds are coupled. And you can see that the way by which we couple the cloud and the strength of the coupling really dedicate the uh, patterns that we get. So sometimes the clouds prefer to maintain a, a, a circular symmetry. So, so uh, the, the inner cycle is up and then the next cycle is down and then the next cycle is up and down. Okay, this is very regular. However, if we change this, the, the strength of the coupling, suddenly we, we get other solution. We get linear solution. We get very complicated solutions if we have interactions of other clouds and interactions uh, with, uh, with other processes. And then, you know, we can get uh, regimes, very complicated regime that start to mimic what we see on real clouds. And suddenly we see the coexistence, okay? We see clouds that oscillate and near them, we see cloud, clouds that are in steady state. So suddenly we have coexistence, okay? And then we have uh, something that, uh, you know, this is more uh, chaotic. So we can get chaotic uh, uh, solutions of this field. On the other hand, we get what is called pox, 
uh, uh, pocket of open self. And this is stuff that we see in nature, that basically we have a closed cell regime, but suddenly an area within the regime is open. And the question is why? And actually we see here that this could be a simple solution of the field, okay? Fluctuation, internal fluctuation of the field can create pocket of open cells. So you see, we took this as simple as, as, simple as possible model and we can learn uh, uh, many, many new, many things, okay? For example, here we impose the ship truck. So we have a ship truck a area with the, with the higher concentration of aerosol. And the question is, can the ship truck decouple the lower part from the upper part? Okay, or is, is it still connected? Okay, and what the clouds could do the to the ship truck? And suddenly we can see that even within the ship truck, we see oscillations, okay? And I want to summarize my talk the, without giving many, many answers, but I hope that I introduce kind of a interesting approach to the problem. And, I, and I, I will return to my basic question. So the basic question is why clouds are responsible for the largest error in the climate prediction. And clouds are responsible because of the nonlinear comp components, but now I want really to give it names, okay? So cloud system exhibit high level of self-organization producing rich gallery of patterns, okay? The organization state, we call it sometimes phases, can bifurcate to other states from close to open, from cloud streets to, 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 uh, to trade commerce, from, uh, from federal to, to other. I mean, we have many different of states, okay? Some of the states are steady, and some oscillate, and some show continuous evolution, which is more in the chaotic regime. Now, this is uh, the summary, okay? Sim simple scaling laws will not apply for clouds. Why? Because without knowing what triggers these bifurcations, how they are depend, how they depend on the thermodynamic parameters and how to correctly capture them, capture them, climate models will likely to miss critically important player in the energy budget. So these bifurcation are key to our understanding. We must understand how cloud field jump from one regime to the other regime. We must understand non-linearities and all the att attempts to do to find scaling laws to sub uh, voxel scales are very dangerous in the case of clouds because of all of these nonlinearities. So my bottom line, my, my, my last line is that we must understand better these bifurcations. And thank you very much and sorry for the long talk. Thank you very much, Ilan. Uh, Amazing talk. Thank you. It was really uh, very uh, enlightening to learn more about uh, cloud patterns. And um, I'd uh, like to, we still have time, so it's, it's not a problem that your talk took a bit longer. I think everybody was very interested and fascinated. So, um, but I will go on to the questions now. And uh, actually, uh, Theo asked, quest asked a question some time ago, but I didn't see it in time, so I didn't interrupt you. He, um, I don't know if he wants to talk by himself or a question. Maybe, yeah, I mean. Theo? Please. Hello. Hey. Hello. Well, uh, I, I was just wondering, you started your talk showing shallow cumulus in the Amazon, then you move it to stratocumulus in ocean areas. I was just wondering whether it's possible to apply the same approach for 
for shallow shallow cumulus. It's, it's, it's a completely different dynamics, I know. But uh, have you thought about this before? Not only that I'm thinking about it, actually, we have uh, one paper in review and uh, two more uh, in uh, boiling we are, we are preparing. So the answer is uh, um, completely yes. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the answer is yes, because once you capture the, the way by which they're organized, the clouds are self-organized, it's uh, you can you can start to formulate a toy model that is linked to the to, to the cloud physics the best you know of these clouds. So for of course it would be challenging because fluxes from the Amazon are completely different to fluxes from the ocean and we have a very strong journal cycle and we have a lot of dependency we uh, whether we are over the 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 rainforest or over deforested area and so on so yes there are many many challenges but uh, in essence uh, we 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 use the same methodology now to study these clouds so uh, um, I hope that uh, by the end, uh, no, no, by the end of next year, we will have uh, more concrete stuff okay. to show. Happy to hear that. Mm. Okay, and then we have a question here from Laura Gallardo, but she says she doesn't have a camera nor a mix, so I will just uh, read her question. She says, Ilan, absolutely fascinating. A philosophical, but to some extent pragmatic question. Should we move to complex system theory? Our models are still highly linearized. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, 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 well. First of all, uh, thank you for, 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 for the good words and I hope that it wasn't too long. And um, uh, I don't know the answer. So it's a very good question. I don't know, uh, my privilege is that I am not a GCM person. So it's not fair, I complain about GCMs and I have uh, a lot of criticism, but I never ran a GCM and I know that it's a very challenging field and people who are running GCM has to be so clever in so many fields. So uh, I don't know if we can, uh, the, the way by which I was thinking of adding uh, um, uh, the information is uh, mostly by using a better parameterization. So use whatever GCM uh, you are using, but uh, maybe you can uh, add uh, some clever uh, uh, functions that can capture bifurcations. Because if you want, you, you know, in, in a GCM uh, a pixel, you want to know the amount of cloud, the amount of liquid water content, the, 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 the level of the clouds, the, you know, the albedo. And uh, of course, uh, they are using a lot of assumptions, but I think that most of the assumptions will not capture bifurcations. Most of the assumptions are quite linear based. So I think that we need to find a, a, a creative way to uh, translate such information to the GCNs. And um, I leave it to the GCNs to help me, help us uh, find such a way. Okay, thank you, Ilan. And now I will give the word to Alexandre Correa. We cannot hear you. Oh. Okay, now you can hear me, right? Now. Yes. yes. Okay, thanks, Ilan, for this excellent talk. It's, uh, it's amazing, as always. Very good to see you and the people here. Thank you. Uh, I never wanted to hug a toy model, but I think I'm going to start to think about that now. Uh, 
I, I, I would like just to know a little bit more about this, um, the first bifurcation you showed, uh, like oh. the, the D star parameter, you start to increase it. And when, when it gets to 0.8, everything happens, that the magic happens there. So can you talk just about that bifurcation? Because I think that's, uh, that's the, the first point that, that caught our attention here. So Okay. Uh, I want to share a slide. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, wait. How do I? Oh, share. No. Basic. Okay. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Yofi. So basically, to uh, Alexander, to answer your question, ah. Uh, I want to find the best way to answer it. It's a, it's not time. simple question. It's Don't not simple. Don't worry. Question. It's not a simple question at all. So, basically, when we use the normalized, uh, uh, the the, the non-dimensional uh, version of the toy model, we separated the variables to two components. So D would uh, be the delay. Okay, do you see my mouse? Okay, so D would be the delay and mu would be a fraction. Let's see if I can, I don't want to poison you with many equations. This is really not what I wanted. <laughs> okay, um, mu would, would, uh, would be uh, proportional to the aerosol concentration and to the thermodynamical parameters. So basically, um, when you increase, uh, when you when you increase the aerosol uh, level, you increase mu. Okay. When you make the cloud deeper, you decrease mu. Okay. This is uh, in a very simplistic way. But then this is the solution space. So if you draw uh, this is the parameter space. So this is D and this is mu. And you see that when uh, mu is small, you are in the oscillating regime. Okay, so this is the oscillating regime. So one condition to be on the oscillating regime is to, uh, to, to, to have a relatively low concentration of aerosols. And what do I mean by oscillating regime? Okay, so it's all competition of recharge and discharge. Okay, the beginning you have no cloud, and then the cloud grow exponentially. Once it grows exponentially, it start to form rain, and the rain it takes time for the collision coalescence and for the droplet collection to 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 kick in, and this is the delay. Once the rain becomes efficient and goes uh, and sediment below cloud base, it starts to deplete the cloud that created it. Okay? And then it depletes the cloud. It can deplete either all of the cloud, and then you left with no clouds, or it depletes part of the cloud. Once rain stops, you have again recharge process. The cloud grows again, reach a stage, a critical stage, form a rain, and so on and so forth. So basically, we called it in the paper a predator-prey cycle, okay? Which the predator, the rain is the predator. So the bifurcation line in the parameter regime is this line, okay? This is the line that separates the oscillating part from the non-oscillating part. Now, with no delay, you will never have, you will never have oscillations you have only the steady state. So in cases of no delay, only steady state. Once delay kick, kicks in, it depends on mu, whether you are in the oscillating or the non-oscillating. You can reach the oscillation or you can reach the, the first bifurcation line or point either by cleaning 
the aerosols or by making the cloud thicker. Okay, in a very simplistic, or you know, you can play also with the characteristic time, but you know, just to, this is the model, it's as simple as this. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ilan. Are there any more questions? We still have, uh, we have half an hour still, if uh, there are questions or comments. Yes, I have one question. Hi. It's uh, Idikli. Idikli has a question. Yeah, uh, Ilan, it's a pleasure to see you talking. It, uh, I like the way you, uh, you talk because you have so many questions <laughs> and uh, each question is a uh, doctorate or a PhD. <laughs> uh, so I, I would like to know, uh, since my uh, research field is uh, it's air pollution, I would like to know um, uh, the mega cities in general emit a large amount of anthropogenic aerosols, uh, mainly because of uh, vehicles and industrial activities. So I would like to know uh, how these anthropogenic aerosols contribute to, uh, to the cloud formation and precipitation. Because uh, I, I, I really not sure uh, if this kind of aerosols contribute to precipitation or it's or not, or yeah, so this is my question. It's, it's, it's a great question. And the answer is uh, yes to everything. I mean, it, can, it depends, okay? There is no one cloud. So it depends heavily on the aerosols that you emit. It depends heavily on the environment, on the local aerosols. And it depends uh, on the thermodynamics or on what type of cloud uh, you are dealing with. So if you, for example, roughly speaking, if you, uh, when you, usually when we are talking about uh, uh, pollution, we are talking about uh, fine mode aerosols. So the aerosols are relatively, I mean, sub-microns, right? And uh, therefore they are not, uh, uh, they are not very good CCNs, but however, you, we have many of them. Uh, it means that uh, the effect on small cloud, okay, small cloud, small warm cloud is likely to A, uh, suppress the rain, B, uh, shorten the lifetime of the cloud significantly. Why? Because once you create clouds uh, that is formed by many but small droplets, you increase the surface area. Now the surface area uh, means that you will have a very efficient condensation, but very efficient the same way evaporation. And due to mixing, because small cloud is mostly mixing, Mo small cloud is mostly entrainment. You hardly have a core in a small cloud. So basically the mixing component would be more important and the cloud will evaporate faster. So A, you suppress rain and B, probably the cloud will, be evaporate, will evaporate faster. However, once you move to a larger cloud in which the ratio between core to periphery is larger, then it's a, it's a completely different story because then you can uh, kick in the effect of invigoration and basically you change the mobility of the droplets. And so for the same uh, updraft, the small droplets will move faster and up in the cloud and then you increase the, 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 uh, the, the, the super saturation. And when you increase the super saturation, you increase uh, you increase latent heat release and latent heat release increase the, the, the updraft and you have many, many feedbacks, okay? And then if you suppress early formation of rain, it doesn't mean that the overall effect would be less rain on the surface because after a while, once rain will, once you, you will get a critical, you get to the critical size of the droplets, 
on the upper part of the cloud, collision coalescence or collection efficiency could be much better because you have a higher concentration and you have larger contrast between the collector and the, dro and the, and the droplets. And therefore you can get both increase in the size of the cloud, increasing the lifetime and increasing the amount, the overall amount of rain. So the bottom line, uh, th there is no easy answer, okay? Mm -hmm. Depends on the, if, if it's a marine cloud, it would be different from a continental cloud. And if it's a, a stratiform cloud, it would be completely different. And if it's tropical cloud, where the environment is relatively humid, again, it would be different. So unfortunately, there are no simple answers to such questions. It, they are all, the, 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 the question is important, but the answer is super complicated. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ilan. So now we have a question by Mikhail Ciccini. Yes, hello, uh, I'm Mikhail. I'm, I'm a postdoc from University of Sao Paulo. And uh, I wanted to ask a question about the shallow clouds in the Amazon specifically. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to know what you think about what is the, ro the role of the cloud microphysics on this self-organization of the shallow cumulus fields. And if, because uh, sometimes I get the feeling that we can uh, reproduce these self-organizations if we have a, we, even with a simplistic microphysics scheme, for instance. Or do you think we, we can, we, uh, we need to have high precision in the microphysics description in order to study this uh, self-organization and the cloud streets and so on? So my, my first guess, my, my first guess is that uh, you can do with very simple microphysics. Uh, microphysics is very close to, to me and I will learn microphysics for many years and coupling to dynamics, but not here. So I think that you can keep it simple. Basically, these clouds are, uh, they, they, they are hardly precipitating, right? Uh, I mean, you can find few events of precipitation, but the precipitation is not an important component of their formation. They are small and, uh, you know, the environment could be polluted enough. And so uh, you, you don't see uh, pre precipitation does not play uh, a critical role in these clouds. And therefore, you know, if you use, uh, usually I, I, I am very suspicious in bulk microphysics and I think that uh, it can create a lot of problems. But in this case, if you want to learn cloud organization, I'm betting, okay, but it's not an educated answer. It's just my gut feeling, okay? I'm betting that you can, for a start, for sure, start with a very simple microphysics. Uh, interesting. Because uh, I, I think I was studying clouds in the Amazon and during my PhD. And uh, sometimes the microphysics uh, feel like they are a response from the thermodynamics and aerosols, and they don't seem to uh, affect it. It's hard to say because they are all coupled, but uh, sometimes it's they are more a response from the thermodynamics and aerosols than they actually impact on, uh, on the other way. <laughs> as, 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 as I answer Eric, I mean, it depends very much on which cloud you are dealing with, okay? So if yes. you go to the, to the convective, to the deep convection, then uh, I think that the Amazon is uh, one of the best, if not the best laboratory for cloud aerosol interaction. And uh, many studies uh, uh, were uh, done over the Amazon and uh, I was involved in, in few of them. And it's, it's a beautiful place to show how important aerosols are. So uh, if, if, if you go to deep convection, I have no doubt that you must know uh, a lot about aerosols in order to understand the clouds. 
Okay, of course it is coupled, but this is a problem. This is why it's very hard to, to scale it to GCM because the scaling, uh, the scaling laws, the simple scaling laws will not apply to cloud aerosol interaction because it's very, yes, whatever goes up should go down eventually. So you can do a closure systems, but what is the scale of the closure system? And where do you put your water vapor? And where do you evaporate the clouds? And how much of the, what portion do you rain? And what portion do you evaporate? And aerosol play a key role in such questions. So uh, when I said that uh, for, for the shell or warm uh, clouds, I would keep it simple. I would keep it simple as a first approximation. Later on, I will definitely add the, uh, the more sophisticated microphysics in order to learn sensitivities. But at the beginning, just as a first approximation, I would, I would do it. When you go to deeper clouds, for example, these shallow clouds, during the late afternoon, they tend to cluster and to form uh, deeper clouds, right? And then it becomes deeper and deeper and this cl cloud, the, the shallow uh, uh, dissipate. So if you want to learn such transitions, oh, you must know about aerosols because the transitions would be affected significantly by aerosols. So as long as you learn the shallow clouds by themselves, okay, you have a discount, but be careful. Thank you, thanks a lot. Okay, so the next question is by Raquel Albrecht. Hey. Hi, Ilan. I, I don't um, see Raquel. Hi, Ilan. Here. Ah, okay, hi. Uh, Ilan, uh, I'm wondering that, uh, have you got any kids? Uh, yeah. Sorry? The qu it's, it's Raquel Albrecht and then it's you, sorry. Yeah. Can you wait? Yes, yes. Okay, Raquel, oh, sorry. That's <laughs> it's okay, no worries. Uh, oh. uh, so thank you, Ilan, for your excellent talk. And um, um, if you don't know me, I'm from uh, University of Sao Paulo also. I work uh, with uh, Mikael also in the Amazon. And uh, some of your um, slides or your talk raised me like a, a few uh, memories from watching convection over the Amazon along all these years is that uh, you showed the example in the coast of Israel where you had the transition from the linear uh, cells to the more deeper uh, raining cells <coughs> and yeah they they are deeper but then when we go to the Amazon we have the same thing uh, if but it is like the even uh, more uh, extremes. Uh, we go from the very uh, small uh, low level boundary clouds where we can see those very nice street clouds that you also showed a few, a nice picture from um, uh, the satellites. And later in the day, we explode to the thunderstorms with the very, um, cellular uh, dependence right. and uh, that raised me a memory of also that uh, nowadays we have the geostationary lightning mapper and uh, we can see those features also on lightning which will be actually on the transition not from the low level the, the very small ones which we don't have lightning on those but going from the um, the ones with there a little bit deeper and then the monsters. We can also see this transition. And um, so can we also call this like the bifurcations or is just a matter of the diurnal cycle or going to a more deeper question on the Mikael's <laughs> line, where can we put the aerosols there on this timeline? It's, it's, a, it's a great question, uh, so great that uh, I, most of the things I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, where to, 
what I mean, it's very uh, some of the transitions could be a, a less sharp or could be due to a sharp transition in the environmental conditions. And we have to be careful. So for example, you can follow clouds and you can see, I'm not saying that this is the case in, in the Amazon, but uh, for example, over uh, Israel, over the Eastern Mediterranean, it's a frontal system. So many times you have collision between two body of errors with completely different uh, properties. And then when you look from satellite, you see a very sharp uh, 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 change in the cloud properties. But over there, it's not a, a bifurcation. Bifurcation is something that is internal to the system. So basically, you leave most of the, of the parameters uh, the same, and you play only with one controlling parameter, and boom, you move from a, a stable condition to completely crazy condition. This is bifurcation. If you have a sharp transition, but it's due to external forces, then you need to understand the external forces. And in that, uh, in, in, in that note, you know, we have a strong diurnal cycle in the Amazon. So it's very challenging to decouple the, the, the effect of the internal dynamics from the effect of the diurnal cycle from the effect of aerosols. And it's a beautiful question and I have no answer. Okay. That's fine. That's why we are here, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it's a beautiful question. Well, if, even so, it was a beautiful answer also. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now let's go over to Aki's question. Now it's your turn. Aki. Uh, hi, Ilan. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering that, uh, have you got any experience or the papers related to uh, There will be a good uh, example to interaction between cloud and RSO, it can be uh, ship tracks, right? Right. Uh, and is there any uh, have evidence that uh, during ship tracks, there will be more convective clouds occurs or uh, low level clouds? And during ship travels, uh, the uh, percentage occurrence of convective or uh, low level class increase or decrease during the time, have, a, have a, uh, trends. Okay. Um, I want to try and to show, uh, okay, let me see. Um, uh, actually, Aki, I think that you, show, you saw it on the summer school, but you will have to see it again now. Do you see my, uh, my screen? Yes. Okay. So to answer your question, this is a, a satellite and I think that many of you saw it. So basically, uh, these are a few days, right? or maybe one day over the North, uh, North uh, Pacific. I think that this is uh, the, the West Coast. You see the West Coast of, uh, of uh, North America. And basically you see ship tracks. And I think that this can answer your question. So let's move to one snapshot. The, uh, so-called natural conditions uh, are uh, where I put my mouse. Do you, do you see this corner of the slide? This is uh, the, the so-called natural conditions. So you see that these are, I would not call them open cells because it's a mishmash between closed and open, but I will call them uh, clouds with very low albedo. You see the ocean, you see that they reflect a much uh, a small smaller portion of the of the sunlight, and you see the sharp transition due to the shield tracks. So all the lines, all the white lines, white reflectance lines here are shield tracks, and basically 
not only that we see, we, we see ship tracks, even this part of the image, which looks completely natural, is actually an old ship track. So you can see the, the anthropogenic effect in a very clear way. It can close the cells or it can increase the albedo. And sometimes, not always, okay, it depends on the thermodynamics. Sometimes the ship track disappear fast and sometimes they do not form at all. But sometimes if the conditions are relatively stable, they can last for many, many days. So here the anthropogenic effect of the ship tracks is huge. So potentially, I hope that I am answering your question, but uh, ship I would not ca call it a, a bifurcation because uh, it's not a delicate change in the aerosol concentration. It's a jump in the aerosol concentration from few tens per cubic centimeter to few hundreds or maybe thousands per cc. So this is not a, a beautiful example for bifurcation because basically you increase the aerosol loading in, in few orders of magnitude. It's not this. When I say bifurcation, is small changes in the aerosol concentration and boom, the system jumped from one state to the other state. But if you want to, 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 to convince someone that there is anthropogenic effect and the ship tracks, this is a, a, a very clear example. Okay, so we can take uh, one last question. Does anyone still have a question? At the moment, apparently not. So, Ilan, I will make some last curious question to you. You uh -oh. said uh -oh. you had a lot to tell us. No, nothing complicated. <laughs> you oh, now, now I have lost. Okay. <laughs> you said you had, in the beginning that you had a lot to tell us about these uh, fairy circles in the desert. And ah. I about uh -huh. it. Okay. Okay. So you can consider me as Wikipedia because this is the, my, the level of my understanding on the topic. But uh, let me go. <clears throat> okay, let me share the screen. <clears throat> okay, do you see the, the, the slide? Yes. Okay, so these are uh, fairy circles in Namibia. And basically what you see here is uh, vegetation. Okay, so it's a, it's a natural shrub, shrub vegetation. And you see this uh, area with no vegetation at all. And it was a, a mystery because it is well known and the locals, they have a lot of uh, stories about the gods and how the gods created this fairy cycle. But it was uh, uh, from, from a natural perspective, uh, it was a question mark. Nobody knows actually even until today, what is the best explanation for this fairy cycle? So at the beginning, uh, the, 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 the explanation was that it's, a, it's, you know, it's a termite. So you have termites below it they, that eat the, the, the grass and uh, what you see is a signature of the termites. Well, guess what? They went there and they couldn't find a single termite or not enough termites, okay? And then there were other, um, ideas about uh, who knows animals that uh, are responsible for it and they couldn't find the animal that's responsible for it. And basically the current uh, uh, explanation is actually that this is a, a solution of the equation. So basically when you solve the equations of uh, the vegetation budget and you have limit amount of water and you, 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 you let the water, th there is a competition of the roots on the water, you get such solution. So basically this is a natural uh, pattern 
that uh, oh, oh, this is the, the, the most, uh, the newest explanation, okay? And they could show it in equations that basically competition between evaporation and uh, percolation of the water and uh, the roots spread dictate the formation of such ferries. So there is no external force, but it's all natural and it comes from the dynamics, from the internal dynamics of uh, the, the, the uh, vegetation and the water and the atmospheric conditions. This is my Wikipedia level of understanding. Oh, and by the way, the scale is 10 meters. So these are large, uh, okay, I think that you can see here a, a, a trail and here you can see another trail. So it's very large. Uh, I mean, it's 10, 10 meters scale. It's not tiny. It's really impressive. I had seen it before and heard about the termites, but I, I... I didn't know about the dynamic solution. Yeah, I mean, the termite was the <laughs> common solution until people came there and looked for the termites. And apparently they couldn't find them. <clears throat> okay, Ilan, thank you. So we have uh, no further questions here. And uh, also it's almost 11 now. So we're coming to the end here. And uh, yes, do you want to make some final remarks, Ilan? I want to thank everyone, uh, everybody here again uh, for being patient and for sitting uh, in front of the Zoom uh, for two hours. It's challenging. I know, you know, I have a Zoom fatigue after 15 minutes. <laughs> so thank you very much for staying. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to see so many uh, friends. Um, there. Okay, so people are thanking you here in the chat and uh, thanking you for your great presentation. Um, yes, Ilana, I also want to thank you for accepting our invitation of our graduate program and our department at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in Natal, Brazil. And uh, also, especially thank you to that that you hosted your own talk, actually, oh, right. Weizmann right. Zoom <laughs> <laughs> system, because ours was uh, booked, fully booked <laughs> by other colleagues and other events. My so, pleasure. very on, much on behalf of Weizmann. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it was really the best solution. Thank you very much. And I thank everybody for joining us today. It was really great to have you all here. All the cloud aerosol climate system competence here and, uh, and students and postdocs and professors and researchers. So uh, I and other guests. So I thank you all very, very much. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's the final seminar of our seminar series this semester which all happened online. And we have all the talks also on our YouTube channel. And Ilan's talk is the only one that was not uh, transmitted uh, live, uh, but we have it recorded and I will make sure that it will be available on our YouTube channel. It's the YouTube channel of our um, center. So it's uh, the Center for Exact and Geosciences Sciences at the university and at YouTube YouTube channel if you want to send it the link to someone who you think would uh, like to see Lance talk is uh, this from CCET UFRI and I will write it here so just you know if you look for it in YouTube you will find the channel of our center CCT UFRN and uh, I think until tomorrow so Ilan's talk will be there and we also had many different talkers uh, speakers and one other talk in uh, English, actually, by Laura Gallardo, who's our, also assisting here, I uh, was. And um, the other talks are in Portuguese, however. <laughs> but for those of you who speak Portuguese, there are many more of our seminar cycle. So thank you very much for joining. And I wish you all uh, 
um, yes, Merry Christmas already because it's our last seminar talk and a Happy New Year 2021 with a lot of vaccines and less pandemic and uh, with a lot of, uh, yes, uh, with a lot less restrictions than we had this year. So uh, all of you take care. And Ilan, thank you very much again and hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, Ilan. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. How many, how many